First Peter, and we moved into chapter 2 in our Sunday school teaching. As last Sunday, Brother Roger had went through, I think, the first couple of verses in chapter 2. And as I've been preparing for this morning, <clears throat> I haven't been allowed to go too much farther. It's just something that still in my heart that I feel that the Lord wants us to look at this morning. And I want to, I'm going to backtrack just a, just a little bit, but the one thing that, that I feel that the Lord is speaking to His church is to know the difference between the truth and a lie. I just can't get away from that. And I believe it was, it was one day, I don't know, it was one day this week, I was just, I kind of just looked and I seen where that brother, I uh, can't even remember his name. Now, Tony, Tony Davis, Evans, Evans, was uh, on a series of that teaching on the truth and the importance of the truth. And I, and I listened to some stuff he had to say and it, and it really, it really resonated with what the Lord had been speaking to me concerning the importance of the truth, the difference between the truth and a lie. And understanding that, you know, as a child of God, that the truth is all that we have. And it's enough. Yes. It's, it's all that we have, but it is enough for everything that we would ever have need of. And I, and I want to minister that to you this morning to know the value of the truth. Amen. Because, and I, I know that every one of you that are here, that you, you make that, that extra push to be, a, to be here and to, to be a part of the Sunday school class, you want the truth. You want to, to learn more of the truth. And I pray that, you know, that the Lord would give me that today to give to you. Because, you know, it's, it's not about a person that's here or, somebody that does this or somebody that does that, but it's all about Him. It's all about Jesus yeah. and everything that He has accomplished and what He intends to carry out in our life, His children, sons and daughters. I, I just something that I'm so thankful that we have that because of Jesus, yeah. to be a son and a daughter of God. So let's, let's look into the Word this morning. And I want to just start on this note that in 2 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to read 1, 2, and 3. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Now who is he speaking to? He's speaking to the body. He's speaking to believers who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. Notice the words the Holy Spirit puts into print here. This is the Word of God. It's not man's thoughts, just man's good ideas, but it's the very Word of God we have to read from, to, to hear His voice. So we're seeing here that we're talking about people that belong to the Lord. Even denying, he says, the Lord that bought them. So that pretty well tells me that as being a blood-bought child of God, is it possible according to the Word of God to, you know, as it obviously says, to deny the Lord that bought us? That's a, that's, this is not good to do this. This is not where you want to be. This is not what you want to be a part of. You want to separate yourself from this way of thinking. It's, it's a matter of life and death. It says, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their 
pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. This, this word pernicious is it's not a good word. It's, it's a word that describes things that are evil, things that are sinful, things that are self-serving, everything that would appeal to the flesh, heady things that to, to sit under uh, a message or a ministry that makes you feel good, something that brings confidence to one's own strength, one's own being, that you can do it. That the mentality of that, you know, you, you know, you are your own God. And that's basically what it says. That, you know, you, you know, that it's, it's like the, they want to add up to a certain point and then you are your own God. You make your own choices. You direct your own paths. That just sounds like that's against the word of God to me. That, that really doesn't add up to what I've read in the Bible as the truth. And I don't know it from cover to cover. I'm learning. I'm steadily applying myself and wanting to be a student of the Word of God. And that's really what the Lord expects all of His children to do is just to be the student, to be a student of His Word. The value of learning, the value of applying, the value of presenting making that, that time in our schedule, that's, that's, the, that's the tough part we have to battle with every day, right. making that time. Because I don't think there's really anybody in here that couldn't say they'd have something else they could be doing when the Lord starts directing you to, hey, come, come over here and let's pray a little while. Come over here, let's open the Word and let's read a little while. And I'm, I'm beginning to hear that clearer than what I used to do. It used to be mixed with all other kind of things. It would be just, I, I would hear it in my spirit, but it wasn't as clear. It wasn't as denoting of, of a call. It was, it was just like in the middle of a lot of other noise that was in my life at times. But when the, the Spirit starts wooing and drawing us and it becomes clearer, it becomes stronger, that, that indeed shows a, a growth in the Christian that they're learning the value of the time spent with, with their Father. Because it's valuable. It means something. And it's, as being in this country and the freedoms we have in this country... You know, a lot of times that we've allowed that to handicap us, to cripple us in a way because we get so comfortable, we get so lazy. We just get so, I don't know, I mean, just we get numb sometimes because we've got it so good. There's people in the world that don't have it as good as we have it here. And, you know, we, we need to be mindful and always remember that. But the way of truth is where the Holy Spirit just kept putting that in my heart over and over and over, the way of truth, the way of truth. And through, I'm going to read verse 3, it says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words, words that were molded and designed with an evil intent to deceive, to appeal to one's sensual desires to appeal to the the fleshly part of man feigned word words that sound good to the ear that entice the hearers that builds us up in ourself that they make merchandise of you whose judgment now the long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. 
I've said it earlier, and I'm going to say it again. It's, if it's not the truth, it's a lie. And that's, we can't sugarcoat that. We can't, you know, go in the middle, find the common ground on both sides, and everybody be happy. It's either the truth or a lie. And that's what we as the people of God have to maintain the integrity of the truth, to stand in the truth, to walk in the truth, to display the truth at work in our lives. So this way of the truth, as I just read to you in verse 2, it's not only is it given to us as, you know, we know the scripture, John 14 and 6, I believe, says that, I am the way, the truth, and the light. The life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I always get that mixed up sometimes. But Jesus <laughs> is the way, the truth, and the life. Y'all agree with that? Yes. Amen. That's the word of God, is it? He is the life. He is the truth. He is the way. And where was I going with that? Absolutely. We're going to get to that in just a minute, maybe. But there, if you'll look back, and, and I'm just going to backtrack to, to the first chapter in verse 16. It says, that I'm still in Second Peter 1 and 16. It says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So the truth is not a fable. It's not a, you know, something that somebody created in their, in their thinking. But the truth we know is a person. But there's three things that I want to look at concerning the truth. And I really feel, and, I'm, and I had to, you know, sometimes when I, I get something, it just takes faith to go on out there and say this. So I'm going to say it. There's a plan of truth. There is a purpose of truth. And there is a person of truth. And I want us to look at these three points of truth this morning that this way of truth represents. Because not only is it just a plan, not only is it just a purpose, but it's a person, this way of truth. The truth has to be lived. It's not just something that we come to and we pick it up or we take it off the shelf like a commodity that we go find in the store and then we, we you know, then we put it up or we put it in store, but we take it and we consume it. We make it us. We make it that we become what we put into our body. You know, you know what, what's the old saying, you are what you eat kind of thing? Well, spiritually speaking, That's right. it's the same thing. Yes, it is. The truth has to be lived in it. it, it it's, it's our life. It's, it's what gives us our strength, our, our health. Spiritually speaking here this morning, Everything about us as a child of God, it, we are dependent upon His Spirit. The Spirit of God giving us the life-sustaining uh, ability that we need, and it comes through the truth. You cannot get it from another source. You cannot mix it with anything else. It would become polluted or tainted, and it, it, it's not going to do what it's designed to do. It has to be the truth. So the plan of truth. I want us to go, and I'm going to go into the book of Romans, beginning in chapter 9. And I'm going to show you a few scriptures I really felt led to go to. The plan, the purpose, and the person of truth. Romans 9 and 1 beginning, it says, I say the truth in Christ. Not in himself, not in his teachers, but in Christ. 
I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. For time's sake, I'm going I'm to jump around on this, but I encourage you to go back and read this whole chapter. It, it, all, it all goes really good together. Uh, verse 6, Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Verse 7, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. God had a plan for Israel. A plan that God chose Israel that he would, they would be the, the womb of the Messiah to bring forth the, the, the perfect Lamb of God on, you know, into this world. But just because, as the scripture bears out here, that Israel is Israel, they're not Israel. They're not all Israel. I'm going to say that again. They're not, of, they're not all of the promise. What are you saying? What I'm saying is because they are of Israel in the flesh doesn't mean they are of Israel in the spirit. Doesn't mean that they are in right standing with God if they are of Israel in the flesh. Amen. That's what it means. So you're saying that the, a person that is a practicing Jew today is not going to go to heaven? I'm saying that if they are Israel of the flesh, they're not, unless they get things right with the Lord and accept their Messiah, who has already came. That's what the Word of God says. Still looking for their Messiah. Now, the plan of God has not changed. It began before even the world began. The plan of God was to send His Son into this earth to redeem a fallen race. Adam's lost fallen race. God, that was in the mind of God and the plan of God before the world even began. That's how you want to talk about how old the plan of truth is. It's older than me and you can count. Amen. His plans still haven't changed. Even today in this modern time, 2022 we live in and all the the new technology and gadgets and things that we are accustomed to that we use in our daily life. Things are getting more and more available to the common people. Are we using it for what it's intended for? Or do we just use it and consume it upon our, our misguided lust, our false, you know, our what I'm trying to say is our own selfishness. It's, it's easy to do if we're not careful. But thank God for things that are made to make life easier, to make life more productive, to be able to do greater things. And I'm, and I'm just saying that because even though we have these things at our disposal, and it seems like things are so good in that area, it, it almost wants to drive, get man to the place where they don't look to God anymore. They don't consider his maker anymore. They don't, you know, they don't want to include God in their plans anymore. Well, see, that's, that's where we're at today in much of the, of the world, in much of this country. But the plan of truth is still in effect. Yeah. It's still there. There is a, still a need for truth. There is still... A desire, believe it or not, there's a desire, there's hungry hearts today that are seeking truth. And God said he would fill every hungry heart. He would fill those who would hunger and thirst for righteousness. The truth is the only thing that can bring that fulfillment. I want to look down into verse, let's see. I want to keep reading. It says in verse 9, for this is the word of promise. 
at this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. See, whenever the Lord came and, and told that and, and, and gave that, that promise, y'all know the story that Sarah laughed. But this, the Lord told us that this thing is going to come to pass. It's going to happen. This is a promise. And, and in verse 10 it says, And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. This is talking about the twins that were born of Rebekah and Isaac, which were Esau and Isaac. No, no, <laughs> Esau and Jacob, thank you. <laughs> Just make sure y'all listening. Make sure y'all paying attention. But Esau, of course, was a man after the flesh. But Jacob, later his name Israel, was to be a man after the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit. So here, here that, that prophecy was fulfilled. So they, here you have the dividing line of things of the flesh, they, those who follow the flesh and the things of the flesh or the things of the Spirit. And to know that this world is so polluted and it, seem, it just seems like it's just so much more and more growing rapidly, more and more and over of the things that are of the flesh, of our own Mindset of our own and our own will, our own strength, of things that you can do, and it's the the push. And I'm sure that all y'all can see it as well too. That you don't need nothing else. You don't need God, is what they their message are, that they keep saying. But this is we're getting into the purpose of truth now. Go with me into verse sixteen. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. And look into verse 20. Like I said, just for time's sake, go back and read all of this if it seems like this is not fitting together good for you, but I'm really just trying to, to hit the, the high points. Verse 20, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with such long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that he might make known. Here, we, here we're talking about the purpose of truth. That he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore a prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And as he, and as he saith also, and I like this word, O.C., O.C., he's, he's, ta he's talking about Hosea. But I, I, just, I just couldn't help but find that a little bit of amusing. O.C., it says, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. So the plan of God was to bring the, of course we know this, but I have to say this, he, he planned, the plan of God included to bring the, the sons of, of Adam's lost race, the fallen race of man, back into relationship with God. He, he, he called out a, a special people that all this could be brought into being. 
But still, this thing comes on the basis of an individual's decision and their will being in, put into place and believing. And believing, thus saith the Lord. And not just hearing, but we have to believe. There's, a, there's the process that works within us as being Christians, and we have to continue to have faith to believe, to believe what the Word of God has said, that it is God's Word, that it is the truth, and that it is for me to make, to make my life more like His life, that it's not me doing the work, but it's Him doing the work. Through our believing and letting the Holy Spirit work within our life, to, to make us into what he has called us to be, hath not the potter power over the clay. We are the clay. I want to remind you that this morning. We are the clay. And you know, it just seems like there's so many people, and I, I'm, not, I'm truly not trying to be judgmental when I say this, but there are so many people that go under the title as Christian that really has a sign hanging around their neck and it's covering their heart and y'all know what that sign says you seen those little signs that you put on the doorknob and it says do not disturb you know I, I, I know God he he just talks to me sometimes different than he does maybe some of y'all, but I, I really feel like he told me that. There's a, there's a do not disturb sign hanging there. They want to find a place that they can associate with other people that have do not disturb signs. They're looking for those do not disturb signs. Well, I'm going to go over there and, and, and join this group because they have a big do not disturb sign out front. He is the potter. Are we to say to him, don't make it quite like that? Does the clay have power over the potter? I don't think so. The potter has the power over the clay. And we've got so much in this country, so many, so many churches, I'm just going to say churches, so many houses of religion. Let me just say it that way. So many houses of religion that operate under the basis of do not disturb. They have a form of, of godliness, but they have denied the power thereof. And church, I'm going to tell you what. There is a difference. There is a difference. We cannot operate under a do not disturb mentality. There is a difference between rejecting the truth and not having heard that truth given. That, that's a good point. The ignorance of the truth. There is a difference. It's a, that's, and there is a, so there is a need then for the truth to be made known. For us to share the truth. To, for, you know, and, and the Lord, I pray he help us by his power of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere we, everywhere we go, have an opportunity just to share the truth. And in and, and, and love, it's, it's not, and, and it's automatically you're going to be, and y'all know this, you're going to be attacked by being better than them and all that kind of stuff, but that's not the case, and y'all know that, to know that we love that person enough, and that because God is working in us, that we can't do it ourselves. We can't, by our own you know, abilities, love the unlovable. It's, it's God working in us to, to help us do that. So, let's see, where was I at? It says, uh, verse 26, where I start. I want to I go on and read verse 27. It says, Isaiah also cried concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Saboth hath left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and had been 
made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith. So we're getting now looking into that person of who, well, what truth actually is. Of who truth actually is. But as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. And the last verse of the chapter says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him, see that stumbling stone is a person. It's not a thing or an inanimate object. And his name is Jesus. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Oh, there's going to be offenses come because of the truth, because of believing on the truth, believing in the truth, letting the truth work and, and, and plan and build in our life. But in the end, he says, you shall not be ashamed. I think about Jonah, and I, I was reminded of Jonah. And I may go there in just a minute, but I, I want to just give you some thoughts concerning Jonah. Jonah, it's, it's a really short chapter of the Bible. I think three or four chapters, I don't really remember, but it's short. But there's a lot said to be said there in Jonah. When it begins off by saying that the, the word of the Lord came to Jonah and told him to go into Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. But it says immediately... Jonah turned from the presence of the Lord and he thought he was going to get away, didn't he? He said he found a ship bound for Tarshish and he got on that ship, he paid the fare and got on that ship and going on down, I think it's around verse 6 or so, whenever the, the storm came and the men on that ship were in dire straits, they were, you know, they were in trouble and they knew it. And they were all begin calling on their gods. And the shipmaster went down into the bottom of the ship. And who did he find? He found Jonah. And the scripture says that Jonah was fast asleep. Well, they stirred him. They got him up. They woke him up. Got him attention. Got him on his feet. And they told him, said, look, I, I'm a Hebrew. I serve the God of, that created heaven and earth, the sea, the sky. And they're like, you know, what have you done? I mean, you know, we're, what are we going to do? So they, they kept doing everything they could do, to, but it, they just could not get over the storm. They could not, the storm was seem like going to tear the ship apart. And Jonah finally said, look, you're going to have to throw me overboard. You're going to have to cast me off this ship because I'm the reason that this storm was sent. God's, God, you know, basically what he was saying, God knows right where I'm at. And I tried to run away. He, you know, it was futile. It, it ain't going to work. So throw me overboard. Think about what's, what must have been going through those, those men's minds on that ship. They didn't want to do it. They said, Lord, I pray that his blood not be upon our hands. So they took him and they cast him into the sea. And it said that the Lord had prepared a great fish for Jonah. And it says that he was in that belly of that fish for three days and three nights. Now, throughout this story, and, I, and I, I encourage you to go back and read that. To just take time and read that. See what the Lord speaks to you concerning that. He, he had a plan. The plan of truth was presented to Jonah. To go and basically cry out against that city, against our wickedness. 
Well, Jonah refused. He, he, he decided he was going. You know, he was bigger than that. He didn't have to do that. So he, he went his way. Well, whenever the Lord spoke to the fish after he cried out to him in the, in the belly of the fish and it vomited him out on the on the land. It said Jonah picked himself up. He arose. The Lord spoke to him again, so he arose and he went on. He, and he went and preached to that city. And this was a city of like 120,000 people. It was, a, it was a lot of people there. And he went to that city and he preached against it. And immediately, from the greatest to the smallest, the king of the city commanded everybody to repent, to to you know, put on sackcloth and ashes. Even the animals of the people were to fast. He proclaimed a fast throughout the whole city. He said, maybe, maybe, just maybe, that God will change his mind and he won't destroy us. Just maybe. It's worth a shot. So the purpose of truth then had an effect on all those people. It caused those people to realize that, hey, I don't have nothing to lose. I've got to, I've got to get my life right before the Lord. I've got to, to get things, you know, back on track. And then throughout all of this, the Lord reveals himself even to Jonah. Through his agony, through Jonah sitting and, and watching and waiting what would happen to the city of whether... You know, God was going to go ahead and destroy him or not. But he began to reveal himself to him, I believe, through by, even by allowing the gourd to grow and give him some shade over his little booth that he made there. And then even the next night he allowed a worm, he prepared a worm to come and destroy that vine, that, that shade that he had. And, and, and Jonah got in such despair and such agony. But you know, God had a purpose. God had a plan. And he revealed that to Jonah said, to know that his plan and purposes, what does it say in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 55, that for my, my thoughts are, see, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. That everything that sometimes we think the way that God's going to do something is not the way that he does it. We have to remember that he is the one that's in charge. He is the one that wants to take us and make us into what he wants. To have his way in our life. And that's, that's something I just, I just really felt like throughout this message that the Lord wanted to remind us of that. That it's sometimes we get it stuck in a rut. We get stuck in a, in a rut to where we think that, you know, well this is, you know, I, I'm just going to keep pushing and driving on and if we're not careful we'll lose expectation we'll we'll get discouraged we'll we'll just like Jonah we'll get you know we'll just say Lord it'd just be better if I just die but God's got a plan and he's going to see us through he's going to see that that plan is unfolded in just the way that he's intended for it to be so just never never take our eyes off of the truth and I was going to get over into um uh, Another part, but we'll we'll go there another time. But thank y'all for your your attention this morning. I pray that somewhere somehow that this was a blessing to you. Got some good out of it, and just trust God that He'll see us through. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank y'all.